وقوله قول صدق وفعله مأمون أجب نداء السماء يا سيد الأنبياء أجب نداء السماء يا سيد الأنبياء The scholars of Islam um, differed about the exact date of uh, Al-Isra Al and Al-Mi'raj. There are a number of dif differing opinions on the chronology of the event of Isra Wal Mi'raj. From the earliest sources, um, there are no actual dates that are 100% agreed upon. They differed in terms of the day, uh, they also differed in terms of the month, and they also differed in terms of the year. And in fact, in the earliest sources from the Sahaba's time, people don't mention dates, uh, definitely not dates. They try to mention the time of uh, which year it happened. Some say it happened even the first year after prophethood, which is a strange opinion, but it's there. Uh, some say it happened you know, one year before the Hijrah, some say three, five, different opinions about that. And even with terms of the month, some say it happened in Rajab, some say it happened in Ramadan, some say it happened in Rabi'ah. It's so a whole range of differing opinions about uh, when it happened. And uh, that remains something that exists obviously today because there is no correct, authentic narration which can remove uh, the difference. There are scholars who believe uh, that this event took place uh, at the time when the Prophet ﷺ was actually given revelation. This is the first year of his prophethood, not Hijri, his prophethood. Uh, when he was given the revelation in the cave, as we know the story, Rasulullah ﷺ was in the cave of Hira and Jibra'il came to him with the first revelation of the Qur'an, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, uh, khalaq al-insana min alaq, and um, first five verses of Surah 96 were given to the Prophet ﷺ. So Imam Tabari, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, he was of the opinion that this incident actually took place uh, in that particular year or that particular time, or during that time. Imam Qurtubi has the view that this occurred in the fifth year of Nabawi, uh, not Hijri, because uh, the year Hijri year is different to the year of prophethood, because the Prophet ﷺ had been a prophet for five years. So Imam Qurtubi's view was that. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, another scholar, Allama Mansur Puri, who had uh, written a book in the 19th century on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, titled Rahmatullil Alameen. In this book, he asserted that this incident took place in the year 10 of Nabawi. The reality of uh, the religion of Islam is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes doubt uh, from people whether it's necessary. So for example with regards to Ramadan, there's specific ibadah related to Ramadan. So we know when Ramadan is relating to the Friday, we know certain things. But when it comes to things that are not linked specifically to an ibadah, so we don't find any sound hadith uh, which the Prophet ﷺ says that you must do this on Isra and Mi'raj night, so it's not related to any religious practice, uh, therefore there is no real necessity for knowing uh, the date. It's nice to know roughly when it happened, and that's why we have, uh, you know, a, a sort of a wide, wide spread opinion that it happened on the 27th uh, of Rajab, but that's probably related more to an opinion, taking consideration other facts, maybe there's some historical reading into that. Uh, from some of the scholars. This shows us that there is ikhtilaf, there is difference among the scholars of Islam as to when this event occurred. Now we know for certain that this event occurred after the 10th year of prophethood. When Khadija radiallahu anha died and when Abu Talib died and when the Prophet sallallahu was stoned in the city of Taif. How do we know this? Because we know from authentic reports that Khadija uh, passed away in the year 10, which is known as Amul Huzan, or the, years, the year of sadness, uh, for the reasons already uh, um, mentioned. So, uh, five daily prayers, we are told by authentic reports uh, regarding this particular event, uh, were given to the Prophet ﷺ on the seventh heaven. And five daily prayers were made obligatory after the death of Khadija. So we know for, from authentic reports that these daily prayers were made obligatory upon Muslims after the death of Khadija radiallahu anha. So this makes it almost certain that it happened after the year 10. Okay? To be more certain, we have no doubt that this event took place 
after the year 10 and before uh, uh, the migration to Medina. So it happened between the year 10 to 13 of Nabawi uh, in between this period. We have no authentic reports with regards to the actual date of the event. There are indications, there are opinions such as the 27th of Rajab, for example, is a date which is recommended by some scholars based upon certain uh, reports. Some are weak, some are strong. And then there is another opinion that it happened in, uh, the, uh, in the month of Rabi'ul uh, possibly second of Rabi'ul uh, in the year before the Prophet Sallallahu migrated to Medina. So th the ikhtalaf is huge, but we can be certain to summarize that this event happened after the year 10 of prophethood and before the migration of Medina. So most early scholars are agreed that it's on, it happened around the ninth year after his, um, the revelation was sent to him, so nine years in Mecca preaching. Around the ninth, possibly beginning of the tenth. So around the ninth or tenth after he, uh, of his Nubuwa, basically. Um, so this is the rough time period. Um, although later on, people try to pinpoint a month, like some people said Rajab, and uh, some people even gave the date, 27th. But none of this is really authentic, really. Um, nobody knows exactly which date and which month. Um, but it's around the ninth or, or the tenth year. And there's a small lesson there as well. It's not important which date it was. Um, it's not important which year it was. The important thing is what happened there and the lessons from the event. Otherwise, Sahabas and others would have uh, recorded the time and date. Again, we have to be careful because the Prophet uh, very clearly told us what, what is worship, what is the ibadah. He very clearly told us the things that we should be doing. He, he didn't leave anything out. So we know the two conditions for any ibadah is that it has to be sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, it has to be according to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu or something that he approved. You know, sunnah includes approval, uh, command, his action. If it's not in these two categories, um, then really there is a problem in terms of making this into a, a new ibadah or uh, a new ritual in Islam. That's number one. Having said that, it doesn't mean you cannot remember the story. It doesn't mean you cannot talk about the story. Um, it's good. You should talk about it. Uh, you should uh, study it, learn the lessons from it, um, make people aware of it, etc. There's nothing wrong with that. But to fix a certain date and every year, you can't fix the date because you don't know. There's no authentic narration that is on that day. And even if there was, there are so many other things that happened on specific dates. Uh, the Sahaba, first three generations, they never celebrated these dates, never fixed any dates to celebrate anything. Apart from two Eid, nothing else was celebrated. But for education awareness purposes, if every year people talk about this uh, Isra and Mi'raj, simply to learn and take the benefit, then inshallah, there should be nothing wrong. <laughs> We must understand that there is not one report in our authentic sources that gives us the full story. Uh, we have some reports more detailed than others, no doubt, but there are other reports that give us, uh, you know, complementary information, for example. So we, don't, we do not have one report uh, that gives us the full story. On the uh, Isra and Mi'raj, there are many, many narrations, there are many, many stories some, uh, many of them are not authentic. Um, some of them are weak hadith. Some of them are just made up stories later on people made, they added to the story as they told the story in different places. Um, but there are authentic hadith in Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi and other, other hadith collections, Abu Dawood. In Sahih al-Bukhari, for example, the most authentic source after the Quran itself, we have um, about 20 reports uh, from six uh, different companions. In Sahih Muslim, which is another authentic source we have after Sahih al-Bukhari, we have about 18 reports from seven different companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So we can be 100% certain that the Prophet uh, Muhammad sallallahu told about you know, told, he, he actually taught his companions about this particular event extensively. 
How do we know this? By the sheer number of the companions who report about it. So the Isra uh, journey happened, uh, as we mentioned before, it happened during the night. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ was in his house, uh, and then the great archangel Jibreel السلام, comes to the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, some say that he knocked on his door, others say that the roof of the, uh, the house, there's narration about the roof of the house being open, and he sees Jibreel السلام, uh, and that is the beginning of the incident. Another narration says he was in the Kaaba, or uh, on, on the side of the, um, the Hatim, the Hijr. He was laying there or sleeping there and Jibreel alayhi salam came to him in summary. Those are the two versions, although they seem very different, but like Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he, he, he combined the two and he said what must have probably happened is Jibreel alayhi salam came to his uh, house and took him to the Kaaba. Now something happens here which is probably not related directly to the night journey but it's also important is that during that night the Prophet Sallallahu experienced also a kind of uh, spiritual uh, operation. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says that Jibreel Alayhi Salam came and he opened my chest. He opened my chest and he bought a bowl, uh, a gold uh, vessel and in it was hikmah and faith. Iman and Hikmah. Um, and another narration says in it was Zamzam water um, with which his heart or his chest was cleaned, uh, washed. This kind of experience is also important for us to know because it shows how the Prophet was always being inspired and, and, and given direction by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then uh, Jibreel alayhi salam bought uh, the, the Buraq, this uh, riding beast. That animal which is described as larger than a donkey but slightly smaller than a mule. The reason for the name Al-Buraq has been also uh, you know um, explained by the scholars. Some scholars say it, it comes from the word Bark which means lightning. So because the speed of this beast was so uh, fast it was called Al-Buraq. But these are theories we simply simply don't know why the animal or the beast was called Al-Buraq. The Prophet ﷺ explained or described it that it was a beast uh, bigger than a donkey and smaller than mule. Uh, and Prophet was made to ride uh, on it. And then when the Prophet ﷺ rode this beast, it took a leap and one of the leaps it took uh, went as far as the eye could see. This is how huge the leap of this particular beast was. One of the narrations says that when he mounted it, the Buraq was uncomfortable it it kind of uh, uh, you know because he doesn't know who this is he doesn't know that's the prophet وسلم, and jibril tugged at the uh, the the harness and uh, you know rebuked him and said uh, this is the, there has wallahi nobody better than this person has ever ridden you from this the ulama scholar uh, uh, you know assert that other prophets had already ridden al-Buraq, so al-Buraq was used for that purpose. I would like to highlight a point very quickly here. Buraq, people think, was a pegasus, you know, a horse with two wings. No, it wasn't, okay? There is no indication in authentic reports to suggest that it was a horse with two wings. Now, this is uh, an extension of the evidence. We have no evidence with regards to what al-Buraq actually looked like. The Prophet ﷺ simply said it was a beast which was smaller than, a, uh, sorry, bigger than a donkey and smaller than a mule. And that's all we know. What it looked like, uh, you know, there are reports, some reports are very weak, unfortunately, and the description they give is not very convincing. So we just have to leave it as, as that. This animal was to carry the Prophet ﷺ from Al-Masjid Al-Haram, from Mecca, uh, to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in uh, uh, Jerusalem. And then the journey uh, begins. Through that journey, the traditions tell us that the Prophet ﷺ was invited by Jibreel to stop at certain locations uh, and to pray. So he stops in uh, one area uh, which is full of uh, date palms and he prays there. And then later he's told that this is uh, Tayyibah, which is also the other name for al Madina. Uh, he also passes by the area of Madian and he prays near the tree. 
uh, which uh, Musa alayhi rested on escaping uh, from uh, Pharaoh uh, prior to him becoming a prophet. Also, he starts by Turu Sayna, which is the Mount of Sinai, and also prays there. And some even mention a narration that he stops in Baytulaham, Bethlehem, uh, to pray in the birthplace of, of Isa alayhi salam. So these were all stops on the way that also give a significance of the whole journey and that connection uh, of Islam with Musa alayhi salam, with Isa, great prophets of Allah and obviously uh, great instructors throughout time. And then the Prophet وسلم, reaches Al Masjid Al Aqsa. This is not the physical masjid that we see today in Masjid Al Aqsa. At that time, uh, the, the physical building wasn't there. It was the s same space, but this is something in a different world, different realm. It's in the unseen. What we do know from the report that the Prophet وسلم, he went to Jerusalem and Allah tells us that he was taken from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. Now, what does Masjid actually mean? Okay, Masjid is a place of sajda where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was worshipped. Okay, and this is the temple of Solomon. What Suleiman alayhi salam had built, or Dawud alayhi salam had built for the Jews to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not Jews, Banu Israel, to use the right term, Banu Israel, because the, the term Jews didn't even exist at the time, you know, at the time of David and Solomon. Uh, the term Jew was given to the Jewish people by the Romans uh, because they lived in this province called Judea. Judea was the province uh, which we today know as Palestine uh, under a, a Roman uh, dominion. So, Banu Israel were praying in this place. Okay, So the Prophet ﷺ was actually taken to the spot where the masjid existed uh, and he prayed in front of the prophets there. Whether the building actually existed or not, it's not important. We do know um, this journey took place at a very controversial period. Uh, if we were to accept the year 10 onward uh, after the prophethood of this particular uh, uh, event, the date of this event or the chronology of this event, then remember when the Persians had attacked Jerusalem and uh, they had destroyed the city of Jerusalem. You know, they had killed over 70,000 Christians in the city. And the Jews were also part of that army when Jerusalem was invaded because Jews were not allowed to live in Jerusalem. And afterwards, when Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an had taken the city back from the Byzantines, by the Rome, from the Romans, um, he went to the spot where Masjid actually existed. And the Christians used to dump their rubbish in this place. Right? So there was a big pile of rubbish in this place where uh, the Temple of Solomon existed. The reason Christians were doing this was to ridicule the Jews. Right? So Amr bin Khattab and his companions cleaned the place and uh, a masjid was built at that spot. So at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when he traveled to this place, the form of the actual masjid is not known to us. We don't know what it looked like. في ليلة تتزيا بالنور والإشراق جبريل جاء النبي يدعوه فوق البراق هو النبي الأمين له الصعاب تهون وقوله قول صدق وفعله مأمون أجب نداء السماء يا سيد الأنبياء أجب نداء السماء يا سيد الأنبياء